We're going to take you live now over to the House side. It's the House Resources Subcommittee on Parks and Public Lands, and they're talking about something called HPS, the Hantavirus Pulmonary Syndrome. We'll learn a lot more about that from the Chairman, Congressman Jim Hansen, a Republican of Utah. ...to the Hantavirus. For example, the Park Superintendent at Channel Islands has made various statements to the press that seems to misrepresent the seriousness of this disease. In fact, the Park Service has made statements that contradict information provided by the Center for Disease Control and Prevention and the California Department of Health Services on the risk of contacting hantavirus. Furthermore, both hantavirus and the deer mouse that carries it have been identified in other national parks throughout the nation. Studies have indicated that as many as 70 percent of these mice are infected with the virus. <clears throat> Yet the Park Service recently decided <clears throat> to remove warning signs and chose not to specifically inform park visitors about the dangers posed by these infected mice teeming over the islands. Only after media reports and urgent demands from members of Congress has the Park Service stated that it plans to increase public awareness. This hearing will help determine whether the Park Service is stepping up their efforts to increase public awareness, education, and taking appropriate measures to combat this disease. With that, I would thank our witnesses for being here. And now I recognize the ranking minority member for any comments he may have, the gentleman from Puerto Rico. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And we all know hendavirus is a potentially life-threatening illness that is transmitted to human from infected rodents. And the white publicity given to the cases of hentavirus that occurred in the southwestern United States in the early 1990s was the first significant alert to the public about this illness. It was because of that publicity that deer mice in Channel Islands National Park were tested and that the hantavirus was found in some of the mice populations. We understand that the National Park Service has taken several steps to provide the public and its employees with hantavirus notices and education. The NPS has been assisted by, in these efforts by the California Department of Health Services and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, as well as local health departments. Fortunately, no visitor or employee has contracted the hantavirus at the park, but it is obviously something that will have to be monitored continuously. Mr. Chairman, we appreciate the attendance of our witnesses today and look forward to their testimony. I thank the gentleman. The gentleman from California, the author of this legislation, or at least this hearing, Mr. Galley. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you for holding this uh, very important hearing today. I want to thank uh, my good friend and, and neighbor to the north, Lois Capps, for her leadership on this issue and also for being here this morning. Thank you, Lois. Uh, I want to thank the witnesses for coming today. This hearing was called to ensure that the public's health is protected. No one wants to close our national parks. However, our primary concern must be for the health and safety of the visiting public. We must not ignore a potentially fatal situation or fail to adequately inform the public of the dangers and the remedies. In February, the California Department of Health Services complained to the committee uh, that the National Park Service was downplaying the problem at Channel Islands National Park. Signs reportedly were taken down and visitors were not being adequately notified, noticed. As a senior member of this committee, the state's concerns were brought to me. In early March, I called for hearings. In the ensuing months, I stayed apprised of communications among this committee, the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention, the Department of Health Services, and the Park Service. I have served on the Resources Committee longer than any other committee, and I have always been a strong proponent of our National Park Service. But I have become in increasingly disappointed in their response to the hantavirus situation uh, and believe that the response has not been as adequate as it should be. It is true no one has yet contracted the hantavirus from visiting the Channel Islands. It is equally true that it's rare to contact hantavirus, contract hantavirus. However, once contracted, your chances of surviving is only 50-50. This is an extremely deadly disease. During the hearings this morning, we will examine why warning signs were torn down at the Channel Islands and whether or not there uh, is a syst systemic problem in the Park Service's public information system. With the summer season well underway and more visitors flocking to our parks, common sense would dictate that warnings to visitors would be increased, not decreased. If managed appropriately, the risk of contracting hantavirus can be minimized. But every day that the public is uninformed about the danger of hantavirus, we increase the risk of exposure. 
Later this morning, we will hear from health experts about the dangerous and deadly nature of this virus and the horrible disease it causes in humans. Uh, right now, Mr. Chairman, we uh, uh, will use three minutes of the subcommittee's time to watch excerpts from a CDC tape, interviews with some people who have survived the disease. Mr. Chairman, they're the lucky ones, but as you will hear, even they don't consider themselves lucky. I would yield back, Mr. Chairman. Do you want, when do you want to do the tape? We have the tape we could run right now, if we could Is that three all right, minutes. Uh, Is that all right? I'll go ahead and do the tape. When we were on our way to the hospital, I thought then, as we were driving, that we were not going to make it in time because my breathing kept getting worse by the second, and I was really scared that I waited too long. But I will say that it is a horrible ordeal to go through because of the, the speed with which it comes on. You're not prepared for anything like that. And even afterwards, it's hard to even think about it. My worst night after the doctor told my family that it was only a matter of two or three hours, my boys stayed with me through the night. And each time my heart rate would go flat, would holler at me or shake me and say, hey, Dad, it's time to come around. And my heart rate would pick back up enough that at least I was still here. And that's the only reason that I made it, I believe. When I first started getting sick, I guess I just felt like I was just completely tired out. I started out just being exhausted, and then all of a sudden it kind of switched to flu symptoms. And I went to bed for, oh, about three days, and then it started my lungs, and I couldn't breathe. I just felt like I was being suffocated, that somebody was just tightening a band around my chest and putting a pillow over my face so I couldn't breathe. I wish everybody could experience just a minute of what you go through when you have that disease, of what it's like to have that respirator down your throat and to have somebody providing suction for you, to not be able to talk, to not be able to move, to not be able to breathe. The people that think this isn't significant would have a whole different outlook on life if they knew how close I came to death and what kind of a death that is. I guess I remember being in the emergency room a little bit. Remember the oxygen uh, they tried to force in me was like standing behind a jet airplane. And 31, 32 days later, I woke up and the season had changed from being winter to being spring. And that was a shock to my system. People comment about few cases of the virus and that it's not really something to worry about because either they've been around them for 40 years or They've done the same thing for 40 years and they've never got sick or exposed or it's not a problem for them. And it's not a problem unless you happen to be the one that gets infected. And then it becomes a real problem. Is that the conclusion? I think that's it, yes. I ask unanimous consent from the committee that Mrs. Capps, our colleague from California, uh, be recognized to uh, give her opening statement. Is there objection? Hearing none, Mrs. Capps, we'll turn to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for uh, allowing me to submit a testimony, a testimony which I will in writing, but I will also uh, submit it now on the subcommittee's hearing today. I appreciate the leadership of my colleague and neighbor, Elton Gallagly, the ranking member, and um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak to the presence of the hantavirus on the Channel Islands National Park. As you know, the majority of the Channel Islands are located in my district off the central coast of California and are considered one of the natural jewels of the area. I have visited the islands myself numerous times and never cease to be amazed at the diversity of wildlife and habitat that exists there. They are truly a special place, and I can't help but acknowledge that it was my predecessor, Robert Lagomarsino, who worked tirelessly to make these islands a part of the National Park Service. 
Several years ago, however, it was discovered that the deer mice inhabiting the islands are often carriers of the hantavirus antibody, as are deer mice throughout much of the United States. In fact, studies have shown that the virus antibodies could be present in as much as 70 percent of the deer mice population on the islands. And while it is fairly rare for people to contract hantavirus, it can be fatal in nearly half of the cases. And we saw in the video that this is a very dangerous and deadly disease for those who contract it. Needless to say, the presence of it in such a large proportion of the deer mice population has caused alarm with some people in my district. As a former school nurse, I believe we should look to our public health experts in situations like this to ensure that the government, and in this case the Park Service, is taking the necessary steps to safeguard the public health. To that end, I wrote immediately to the California Department of Health Services and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to request both agencies' assessment of the situation and to urge their continued assistance to the Park Service. Last week, I received a response from the CDC, which gave me some encouragement, and I have included a copy of this letter with my testimony. Basically, the CDC says that they have been working closely with the National Park Service and California state officials for several years on this issue, conducting surveys to assess the extent of the problem at the Channel Islands. These collaborations have resulted in a National Park Service manual regarding the rodent exclusion and a National Park Service distributing of various CDC educational materials on hantavirus to the public. The Centers for Disease Control also pointed out that after recent, a recent conference call with NPS and various state and local public health officials, it appeared that the National Park Service has, and I, this is in quotes, an appropriate and comprehensive, quotes, educational program in place. CDC does recommend, however, that the National Park Service increase its outreach program to get hantavirus, hantavirus information to visitors to the park who don't normally come in contact with NPS to the National Park Service, such as boaters and others who enter the park through non-standard entry points. After receiving the CDC letter, I wrote to the superintendent of the Channel Islands to reiterate my support for their efforts and also to put the service to uh, put the services of my offices to use helping NPS achieve this additional goal. And today, I'm pleased that Park Superintendent Tim Setnica will be outlining for you a number of the steps that they plan to take, which include a workshop with local boating groups to increase awareness of the presence of the hantavirus, on which my office will be working with him. And I've made available my office to uh, whatever goals uh, we might have together in making this happen. I look forward to continuing to work with the local Park Service personnel on this and many other issues regarding the islands. Clearly, the presence of the hantavirus antibody in so many of the deer mice on the Channel Islands calls for a continuous and vigilant effort by the Park Service to inform the public of the situation and ways that they can safely visit the park. I support the CDC's view that constant vigilance in public education effort about hantavirus can continue to keep Channel Islands a safe place for the public to visit. I do not believe the park should be shut down or that the Park Service should attempt, as some have suggested, to eradicate the deer mice population. I do appreciate this opportunity to share my views on this important topic and look forward to working with the subcommittee on ways that we can improve our natural par national park system. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Sherwood, gentleman from Pennsylvania, you have an opening statement. Well, I'm very interested to learn a little more about this because I read the articles four or five years ago about the outbreak in the Four Corners region and now I know that we have had three cases in eastern Pennsylvania so I'm here to learn what we can do about it. Thank you. The gentleman from Washington, Mr. Ensley. Uh, gentleman from Nevada, Mr. Gibbons. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm indeed uh, very pleased to be here. I want to thank you for your leadership on this issue and making it available for all of us to have uh, at least an introduction into this terrible disease. I know in the state of Nevada we are plagued by uh, deer mice uh, that do carry the hantavirus. Uh, it's a common uh, disease now that is well known uh, in our state and widely advertised as being present there. We're looking and hoping that there's uh, some resources that will be available to help all people in the uh, infected areas of this disease to better understand it and better deal with it. And I want to thank you again, Mr. Chairman, for uh, having uh, this hearing here today. Thank you, gentlemen. Gentlelady from the Virgin Islands, Mrs. Christensen, to have an opening statement. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you. We'll turn to our first 
and only panel, Maureen Finner Finnerty, Associate Director, National Park Service. She's accompanied by Superintendent Tim Setnica, Channel Islands National Park, National Park Service. John J. Hanley, Director of Public Health Programs, National Park Service. We also have Vicki Kramer, PhD, Chief of Vector Borne Disease Section, California Department of Health Services, James N. Mills, PhD, Chief Medical Ecology Unit, Special Pathogens Branch, National Center for Infectious Disease, the Center of Disease Control and Prevention. And as I understand this, Mr. Gallingly, the uh, uh, monitor is uh, Dr. Bruno C. Kamel, if I'm pronouncing Chamel, uh, veterinarian, PhD, uh, Department of Population Health and Reproduction, School of Veterinary Medicine, University of California, Davis. You have a very prestigious uh, uh, panel here in front of us. And uh, Maureen Finnerty, uh, can we start with you, please? Uh, I, that's quite an important hearing in the minds of many folks, and uh, I surely don't dispute that. Uh, but we still have a rule in the uh, Resource Committee on time. And I hope that you were alerted that you're given five minutes. Now, if you just can't get it all in and you've got to go an extra minute or so, just let me know and we'll give you that extra minute or so. Also, keep in mind that your entire statement will be included in the record. So if you want to abbreviate on that, that's fine. We'll turn to you. Now, the five-minute rule goes like that traffic light in front of you. Same thing. Uh, green, you start. Yellow, you wrap up. And uh, red, we bang the gavel. But in this case, we'll listen. If you have something more you have to say, go ahead. Thank you for the opportunity to address the committee regarding this important issue. The stewardship responsibilities of the National Park Service require us to take care of the natural and cultural resources of the National Park System and to ensure the safety of park visitors. In carrying out this role, we are closely monitoring the hantavirus issue in Channel Islands and are taking steps to decrease the risk of hantavirus transmission as well as to increase public awareness of hantavirus. The National Park Service initiated hantavirus precautions throughout the system in 1993. Hantavirus has been monitored at Channel Islands since 1993 when it was discovered in the deer mouse populations on some of the islands. Since that time, the service has increased both public and staff awareness of the risks of hantavirus through publication of field notices, factual brochures, public awareness items, and other steps, and has taken measures to reduce risk to both groups. Public interest in the issue at Channel Islands was created by news reports of a seven-year-old boy on Santa Rosa Island who handled a deer mouse that later tested positive for antibodies to hantavirus. The boy was tested for hantavirus and the results were negative. Let me emphasize that to date, no one who has visited or worked on the Channel Islands has contracted hantavirus pulmonary syndrome or tested positive for the virus. Following the well-known outbreak of hantavirus in the Four Corners area of the Southwest in 1993, the management of Channel Islands became concerned that the park's populations of deer mice might harbor the virus and pose a health risk to staff and visitors. Accordingly, park staff worked with the State of California and the University of California, Davis, to test island mice for exposure to hantavirus. Two islands showed no evidence. On three other islands, the proportion of mice that tested positive for antibodies to hantavirus ranged from 18 to 71 percent. Concern for the welfare of visitors and residents, the park posted hantavirus warning signs in park campgrounds and included information on hantavirus to campers and visitors. Twelve individuals, both park staff and island residents, including biologists who handled hundreds of deer mice and ranch workers who had worked and lived in mouse-infested condition for years, were tested for exposure to the virus. None of these individuals tested positive. In 1995, additional scientific research was conducted on deer mice and hantavirus in the outdoor areas of Channel Islands. The proportion of mice that tested positive for hantavirus antibodies in that study was 17% closer to the nationwide rate for deer mice, which is about 15 percent. It appears that the proportion of mice testing positive for hantavirus varies from year to year. Because public safety and the safety of our employees are of concern, 
primary concern, the service has developed an extensive and effective public information and education system, which has been commended by the Center for D Disease Control and Prevention and the California State Public Health Department. Among other things, we have posted notifications at the main visitor center, on island bulletin boards, and at the offices of the three park concessioners. We have also included hantavirus information in the park's printed material and on its website and made available in the Parks Visitor Center detailed brochures from the State Department of Health about hantavirus, its prevention, and symptoms. We include hantavirus warnings and orientation talks on the island given by park staff to visitors and include warnings in printed materials given to visitors who are making campground reservations. We are continuing to explore ways to improve our communication about the virus. I mentioned previously the recent incident involving a seven-year-old boy and a deer mouse on Santa Rosa Island. Over Memorial Day weekend, a local family visiting the islands on their private boat put ashore on a remote beach on Santa Rosa. After several hours on shore, the mother realized her son had been playing with the deer mouse for some time. The state informed us after the mouse was captured and tested that the mouse tested positive for antibodies to the hantavirus and the mother was alerted. The state and county health services departments have worked with the family and their physician to monitor the boy's health. A positive test for antibodies does not mean that the mouse actually had or was transmitting hantavirus. Nonetheless, the possibility that the boy could have contracted hantavirus from his contact with the mouse was sufficient to have the boy's health monitored for the duration of the incubation period, which is typically one to four weeks following exposure. On Thursday, June 10th, the California State Department of Health Service organized a conference call to assess the risk of hantavirus at Channel Islands in light of the recent request by Congressman Galegli to close the park. Participants were the State Department of Health Services, Ventura and Santa Barbara County Department of Health, and the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. The meeting participants agreed that although high mouse densities and the presence of hantavirus antibodies combined to create some risk to visitors at Channel Islands, the risks are low, finite, and are insufficient to consider closing the park. The park has identified additional measures to warn the public of the risks of hantavirus. Uh, the risk of contact, contracting hantavirus is actually much higher within structures. Efforts toward rodent exclusion have been ongoing in the park facilities for years, and this year we have taken additional steps to protect park employees. We have inspected all park residents for rodent proofing needs and will make structural changes this summer uh, to ensure that they are rodent proof. Uh, this concludes my remarks, Mr. Chairman. Be happy to answer any questions that you or committee members may have. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, we'll now turn to Vicki Kramer uh, for her testimony. You want to pull that mic close to you? We'd appreciate it. Sure. Good morning, and thank you for inviting me to testify on the issue of hantavirus in the Channel Islands National Park. As you know, hantavirus pulmonary syndrome is a severe and potentially fatal respiratory disease caused by the Sinombre virus. Persons are infected through contact with excretia shed by infected deer mice. As of June 1999, 22 cases of hantavirus have been identified in California residents, of whom 19 are believed to have been infected within California. 11 of these 22 California cases were fatal. The majority of cases occurred east of the Sierra Nevada mountain range. The California Department of Health Services has records of over 9,000 animals tested for evidence of Sinombre infection. Seropositive deer mice have been identified in 41 of 51 counties from which samples have been taken. The seroprevalence in deer mice averages 12.6% statewide. The Department of Health Services conducted hantavirus rodent surveillance on the Channel Islands in 1994. Seropositive deer mice were identified on five of the eight islands surveyed, with a maximum of 71% of the mice positive on Santa Cruz Island. A follow-up rodent survey was conducted by researchers from the U.S. Geologic Survey and University of California at Davis on three islands in 1995 and 96. The maximum infection rate at that time, as was mentioned, was 16 percent on Santa Rosa Island. Blood tests were conducted on park employees and residents of mouse-infested cabins on the islands, and then had antibody evidence of exposure to Sinombre virus. As has been mentioned, there have been no documented cases of hantavirus among persons working on or visiting the Channel Islands. 
On February 14, 1999, the Los Angeles Times printed an article on hantavirus in the Channel Islands, citing some of the surveillance data from the 1994 study just described. On February 24th, Department of Health Services staff met with park employees to discuss hantavirus risk reduction for employees and visitors. On March 23rd, Dr. James Stratton, Deputy Director of Prevention Services of the Department, sent a letter to John Reynolds, Regional Director of the National Park Service, that outlined specific recommendations for educating park employees and visitors about hantavirus and appropriate prevention measures. These recommendations included distributing information pamphlets to visitors, posting public notices at frequented areas, and sponsoring regular safety training for National Park Service staff and other island visitors. Public interest and concern about the risk of hantavirus in the Channel Islands was renewed in June 1999 when the Los Angeles Times reported on a seven-year-old resident of Ventura County who had contact with a deer mouse on Santa Rosa Island. The mouse was subsequently determined to have antibody to Sinombre virus. This incident was the basis for Representative Elton Gallagher to recommend during a June 8th press conference that the Channel Islands be immediately closed until federal land managers devise better methods to notify the public of the risk. The department subsequently convened a teleconference of representatives from the Department of Health Services, the National Park Service, CDC, and the health departments of Santa Barbara and Ventura counties to discuss whether park closure was an appropriate action and what additional, additional measures, if any, should be considered to protect the public health. I have six points to make in conclusion. First, the risk of hantavirus infection for the majority of visitors to the islands who engage in typical outdoor activities, such as hiking, picnicking, and camping, is low. Second, the real or perceived risk of hantavirus has not been the basis for restriction of access to any public lands in the United States. Third, health departments from counties nearest the islands may wish to consider a press release each summer on hantavirus to further inform local residents who may visit the islands. Fourth, the department encourages the Park Service to explore other avenues for disseminating hantavirus information to visitors who may not be reached through standard means, for instance, those individual, individuals who take their private boats to the islands. Fifth, the department believes that the Park Service's efforts to educate staff and visitors are appropriate. And finally, the National Park Service may wish to consider establishing an ongoing collaborative relationship with the Department of Health Services to provide consultation, staff resources, and laboratory support for surveillance of hantavirus and other vector-borne infectious diseases on the Channel Islands and in other national parks in California. The department currently performs such services in national forests in California through a cost-share agreement with the U.S. Forest Service. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kramer. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Mills, turn to you, sir. Good morning, and thank you for your invitation to testify concerning the risks of exposure to hantaviruses for visitors to Channel Islands National Park. Diseases caused by hantaviruses have been recognized for many years in Asia and Europe. However, hantavirus disease was virtually unknown in the Americas until 1993, when a cluster of cases of acute respiratory failure with high mortality drew public and scientific attention to the Four Corners area of the American Southwest. CDC scientists quickly identified the causative agent as a previously unrecognized hantavirus and implicated the primary host, the deer mouse. The virus, as you've heard, is now called Sinombre virus, SNV, and the disease is hantavirus pulmonary syndrome, or HPS. The recognition of SNV led rapidly to the discovery of other hantaviruses in North and South America. At least 23 hantaviruses now have been described in the Americas, each associated with a single primary rodent host species. About half of these, including four in the United States, are known to cause HPS. These viruses, which have no apparent harmful effect on their rodent hosts, have probably existed in rodent populations for millions of years. HPS is characterized by fever, severe muscle aches, and malaise, which may rapidly progress to acute respiratory distress requiring intensive care and supplemental oxygen. The case fatality ratio in the United States 
is 43 percent. To date, the CDC has confirmed 217 cases of HPS in 30 states. Um, SNV, hosted by the deer mouse, is the agent responsible for the great majority of HPS cases in North America. The deer mouse is one of the most common and widespread small mammals in the United States. Uh, many of you have a, a map that was passed out. The range of the deer mouse is indicated by the blue shading in this map. HPS cases have been reported in much of the species range indicated by the red dots on that map, although the greatest number of cases have occurred from the western United States. The most frequent mechanism of infection for humans is probably the inhalation of infectious aerosols produced when rodents urinate. Other possible routes include direct contact with rodents or rodent, or rodent contaminated materials or rodent bite. There's no effective treatment for HPS, and there's no vaccine. Therefore, prevention is the primary tool for lessening the mor morbidity and mortality from this disease. The most important single measure may be rodent exclusion from human dwellings. Simple, inexpensive rodent-proofing methods have been developed and tested during collaborative studies by the CDC and the National Park Service. Outdoor exposures occur infrequently. Recently, two cases of HPS were associated with catching and handling a deer mouse. Prevention of these kinds of exposures are particularly relevant to the national parks, and getting prevention information to visitors sh should be a priority. CDC has published numerous public education materials outlining general prevention and control measures, including pamphlets, uh, posters, and a detailed internet web page. Many of these items have been sent to the national parks, and NPS has developed similar materials. As the nation's disease prevention and control agency, it is CDC's responsibility to provide national leadership in concerted effort to prevent illnesses such as HPS. CDC's recently released plan, Prevent Preventing Emerging Infectious Diseases, a strategy for the 21st century, describes ways to combat and, uh, and prevent future and present uh, emerging diseases. CDC has cl worked closely with state health departments and with the NPS to measure the risk of hantavirus disease throughout the United States and to develop and implement strategies to prevent human exposure. Resulting recommendations have been widely distributed to healthcare professionals and to the public through state and local health departments and by the NPS. Last week, CDC published new data and recommendations concerning HPS in our weekly MMWR report. In summary, hantaviruses are, a widespread and are widespread and very common throughout rural areas of the United States, although we have been unaware of their presence until just recently. The incidence of HPS in the United States is very low, but the disease has a high mortality. Prevention methods such as public education can be effective, especially for specific populations that are easily accessible, such as visitors to specific national parks. And these programs should be vigorously pursued. Thank you very much for your attention. Attention, I'll be happy to answer any Thank questions. Thank you, Dr. Mills. Dr. Chomel, can you hear us? Uh, we can hear you and see you, so we're going to turn the time to you, sir. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Any of you folks uh, want to come it, up and see this? If you do, we welcome coming to this bottom tier. We'll let that be your uh, decision. I'm sorry. <clears throat> Good morning. Oh, excuse uh, me. California accounts for almost 10% of all human cases reported in the USA with a lethality rate close to 50%. Uh, I was personally involved in the early testing of California rodents as my laboratory is performing most of the plague testing for the state of California since 1991 and I had done some work on hantavirus in France with Dr. Pierre Rollin from CDC who at that time was at the Pasteur Institute. With personnel from the <coughs> California Department of Health Services, the Centers for Disease Control and various institutions we initiated serological testing of California rodent for Sinumbre virus. Most of the data from this work was published in Emerging Infectious Disease. We found overall a prevalence rate of about 12% in deer mice. It is at that time, in January 1994, that I was personally contacted by Cathy Schwem, biologist on the Channel Island National Park, 
for investigating antivirus infection as deer mice population was quite abundant on the Channel Island. Our initial work on the Channel Island revealed a very high percentage of infected deer mice and in fact the highest percentage of infection ever reported from any site in the United States, 71% on Santa Cruz Island. Blood samples were taken between January and April 1994. But we have to emphasize that the sample size of our study varied widely from one island to the other. We tested rodents from three islands, San Miguel, Santa Rosa, and Santa Cruz. After <clears throat> sin nombre virus infection was identified in mice from these three islands, mice from the other five channel islands were tested. Overall, the highest prevalence was found on Santa Cruz Island, 71.4%, 25 out of 35 mice. Santa Rosa Island, 58%, 47 out of 81 mice. And prevalence was 18% on, on uh, San Miguel Island, 14% on Santa Catalina Island, and 3% on San Clemente Island. None of the deer mice coming from Anacapa Island, Santa Nicolas Island, and Santa Barbara Island were seropositive for sin nombre virus. Despite the high percentage of positive rodents on some of these islands, no antibodies were detected in Santa Rosa branch employee or Channel Island National Park employees. Because of the peculiar environment of the Channel Island and the high prevalence of infection detected in small sample size, Dr. Tim Graham and myself sought to investigate through a longitudinal study the dynamic of antivirus infection on some of these islands. It was important for us to establish a better estimation of the true level of deer mice infection by conducting those longitudinal studies. The cited above percentage being the reflect of a one point in space time. Through a grant support from the Centers for Disease Control and the National Park Services, we were able to start our project, which was conducted during the fall of 1995 and winter of 1996. However, lack of funding didn't allow to carry on this project initially set for a three-year period. We demonstrated that the prevalence of infection is different on different islands and that various locations on a single island may have specific dynamics. It, is also, it has also been reported that the virus isolated from the Channel Island have a 17 to 19 percent sequence different from any mainland California sequences. This information may have misled some person who thought that the Channel Island virus was different from the mainland virus and therefore stated that this virus was non-pathogenic to humans as no human cases had been diagnosed in person visiting or working on the China Island. If the virus evolved through time on this island, it is, however, close enough to the sin number virus to share its characteristics. For comparison, we will say that they are likely to be two siblings from the same family. Because of the present concern, recently uh, emphasized on the Channel Island, it should be indicated that the hantavirus infection on this island is certainly not something new. The specific coevolution of the rodents and their virus support the fact that the infection is endemic to the island. Therefore, closing the park do, do not appear to be a measure that should be pursued because of the limited but real risk of infection. Education and warning of the park visitors seems a more appropriate approach. In terms of conclusion and recommendation, we will emphasize the risk of antivirus, antivirus infection in outdoor environment is rather low, but should not be neglected. Informative brochure on antivirus and how to reduce the risk of infection, as well as flyers posted on park information posts should be made available at all time to visitors. Information should emphasize children not feeding or playing with rodents. Education of park personnel about the risk on how to inform the public should be performed on a regular basis. And finally, lack of scientific knowledge 
about the dynamic of the hantavirus infection in the Channel Island rodent population should trigger more research as the one we initiated a few years ago. Funding by national park services and federal agencies such as Centers for Disease Control should be provided to support such activities conducted in collaboration by federal, state, and local agencies as well as the national park services and universities. Uh -huh. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Trommel. Uh, we thank the witnesses for their interesting uh, testimony. This kind of makes you a little nervous. Uh, I noticed a man in Utah died cleaning his garage with this, and uh, we had a lobbyist with the, uh, in the military committee who uh, was cleaning his barn out in Maryland, and boy, he, we thought he was gone. They gave him the last rights and everything, and somehow he pulled out of that thing. I, I don't know if I want to clean my garage after this. I will recognize the gentleman from Puerto Rico uh, for any questions he may have for our witnesses. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, the, the lady from uh, Dr. Avaki uh, uh, Kramer, uh, what uh, has NPS not been doing that you would recommend that they do in regarding to advising the public, if anything, uh, as, as to the existence of the hantavirus disease in the deer mice? Over the last three or four months, the National Park Service is to be commended for their efforts to initiate public education and continue um, some of the education they were doing prior to that. I think they've really taken a lot of steps over the last three to four months. During our teleconference, we made two recommendations to the National Park Service on other items that they could do. One was a press release. Um, that either they could put out and or the local health departments in the area could release to reach the general populace. And the second item is to try to reach those people who do not come to the islands through the normal means, um, that is those individuals who may have private boats. And based on the discussion here, it's apparent that the National Park Service is considering that recommendation and already trying to take steps um, to broaden the scope of their public education. Is there any other uh, park, national park or state parks in California that are, have the problems or the, uh, with the hantavirus? Yes, we've identified uh, six or seven other national parks in California that have mice that are seropositive to hantavirus. Um, those include Yosemite, um, where the infection rate was, I think, about 15%. Um, and uh, I believe Sequoia National Park and Lassen National Park. We also have plague in about six or seven of our, our national parks as well. So hantavirus isn't a unique vector-borne disease. The national parks deal with a, a whole scope of infectious vector-borne diseases. And I do have uh, surveillance data from the other national parks. If you'd like me to pull that out, I can give you some more specifics. Thank you. Uh, vicinity? Uh, how detailed are the education efforts for NPS employees and to the public regarding the hantavirus? Um, I can, I, I'll speak to nationally what we're doing and then uh, make some reference to Channel Islands and then have Superintendent Setnick deal specifically. Um, uh, since this disease was first uh, identified as such in, in 1993, the National Park Service uh, immediately started taking steps to notify uh, all of our regional directors and park superintendents nationwide of the existence of this, of the um, uh, information about the disease and its symptoms, and also providing all kinds of procedures and information service-wide uh, as an alert for, for folks to pay attention to it and to start taking some measures. Um, that nationwide um, information really goes out annually. It was first issued in 1993, and we do updates and try to inform people throughout the country of, um, of the existence of that disease, as well as others that uh, park visitors may come in contact with. Um, we certainly, on a, a nationwide basis, have uh, provided funding support through the to CDC to do a lot of various research-related efforts on hantavirus, uh, both in Channel Islands and throughout the United States. We've also looked at hantavirus virus in the eastern United States, and we've also worked closely uh, with CDC and others on, uh, on rodent proofing and ways to, to try to um, 
to alleviate the uh, the uh, this disease in, in parks and to try to uh, you know rodent proof a lot of our facilities and and educate people on food storage and those kinds of things so uh, we have taken it seriously and we have continued to do um, things on a service-wide basis and superintendent said again maybe you can speak to some of the specifics at, at channel islands as far as information and that kind of thing how does the risk of the hantavirus at the Channel Island compared with the risk of hantavirus in other national parks? Uh, some folks here maybe can speak to that. I, I mean, the, the, uh, the percentage of affected mice um, or carriers is, has been very much higher uh, on some of the islands at certain periods of time, maybe as high as 70 percent. My understanding that the national average is more around, around the neighborhood of 15 percent. But that also varies depending on when the mice are tested, and it, it varies seasonally. It, it varies depending on, on temperature and availability of food sources and availability of predators and those kinds of things, is my understanding. The disease has just been identified recently. For, uh, because I remember when I was a child, I, my mother used to tell me never to go around barefooted where there was mice or rats and I had to stay away where they could have urinated or where they had feces. Always, I remember that ever since I was a child. Mm -hmm. So that something, they, people knew that there was something wrong with the, with the feces and the, and the urine of rats, but they, the disease had not been identified. Is that it? That's my understanding is the disease was not identified until 1993, although it's existed probably for three or four decades. Th thanks very much. My time is up. The gentleman from Puerto Rico. The gentleman from California, Mr. Gallagher. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, before we uh, get into the questions, I would ask unanimous consent that the map that Dr. Mills uh, was referring to, uh, uh, showing the cases across the nation, be made a part of the record of the hearing. Uh, Without objection. In fact, this, this map shows that uh, while the, uh, the number of incidents are more prevalent in the West and the Midwest, it's still a national issue. In fact, we have uh, uh, cases on the extreme East Coast as well. So I think that's important. Also, uh, Mr. Chairman, with uh, unanimous consent, I would ask that a, uh, uh, a statement by the National Pest Control Association be made a part of the record of the hearing as well. No objection. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Kramer, thank you very much for your leadership on this issue. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you were pleased that in the last four or so months that the National Park Service has been doing a better job. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, as you know, this has been an issue that the Park Service has been aware of, although maybe not all of us have been, since 1993. Uh, if you, for the, the record, I would like to ask uh, that the letter that I sent to the Park Service uh, dated February 23rd, 1999, about five months ago, be made a part of the record of the hearing as well, gotcha. which we hope has, has maybe in some way helped uh, the, uh, the Park Service better uh, advise individuals. Uh, before I go any further, I would like to correct a couple statements that were made, one by uh, uh, Ms. Finnerty uh, regarding my request to close the Park Service. Uh, actually, if, if you want to uh, take that literally, it would mean if there was a request to close the Park Service, it would be on the onus of the, or on the back of the Park Service. My statement early on was that uh, uh, I definitely do not want to see the Park Service closed. However, if they were not willing or capable of notifying the visitors of the risk, that would be the viable alternative. And uh, uh, Dr. Kramer, you had mentioned that I'd held a press conference to ask for the closure. In fact, there never was a press conference. My uh, statements to the press were in response to a letter that uh, was written by uh, Dr. or I beg your pardon, uh, yes, Dr. Stratton in your office to uh, Mr. John Reynolds at the Park Service, express, and this letter was dated March 23rd, uh, uh, and again, this was as a result of the concerns of the California Department of Health that not adequate uh, notification was being done by the per Park Service, is that correct? This was in March that, that uh, Dr. Stratton was expressing concerns that they needed to uh, uh, provide greater public <coughs> awareness. Now, this was basically three months ago. So you had mentioned that they've done a, a much better job in the last four to five months. 
but yet in the end of March there was a letter from your own agency uh, expressing real concern that they were not adequately doing the job. Is that correct, uh, Dr. Kramer? Uh, that's correct at that time. Okay. Steps were being initiated by the, the Park okay. Service, but we just uh, wanted to emphasize there, what we felt needed right. to be done. The, the question that I had, you know, at, now do you know to this date, it's my understanding to date in the past 90 days or three months since this letter was sent to the National Park Service, uh, there has not been a response to that letter by the Park Service. Is that correct, to the best of your knowledge? To the best of my knowledge, that's correct. So, to the best of your knowledge, the Park Service has not responded to the, uh, the concerns of, of Dr. Stratton in the March 23rd letter. Is that that's correct? That's correct. Thank you very much. Uh, I am a, and, and, and Ten Setnica would be, I think, the first to acknowledge that I have been a strong proponent of the National Park Service, particularly Channel Islands. It is truly one of the treasures that we have in this nation, and the fact that it's close to my home district is, is, is very special to me. I don't want to see this uh, park closed, but I do want to see the health of the, the folks there not being compromised either. Tim, there's been some disturbing comments made by some folks, and, and it's my understanding that you have also acknowledged that some of the signs, warning signs and so on, have actually been taken down by members of your own staff. Is that correct? Uh, no, sir, it's not correct. Okay. Uh, here is a sign that is very prevalent on the islands. I've seen it myself. It's a huge sign. It's, in fact, it's uh, above a couple other signs posted throughout the park in bold print. Warning, the horses you may encounter are dangerous. They will bite, kick, and beg for food. Do not feed them, touch, or approach them. The horses are private, privately owned. It appears to me that this notification is, while maybe important, not nearly as prevalent on the island as the notification of the uh, potential dangers of hantavirus. Is that correct, uh, Tim? Uh, no, sir. That notification no longer exists. This has been taken down? Uh, yes, sir. Uh -huh. the, the horses themselves were removed some months ago at the request of the owners. Okay, very well. I see my time has uh, expired, Mr. Chairman, but I, I do have a couple other things. Maybe we'll have a second round. We will have a second round at your request. The gentlelady from uh, Virgin Islands. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to welcome the panelists this morning. And <clears throat> while we recognize that the person and the family who might be infected by this virus, of course, is the most important individual to be concerned about and in that case even one infection given the high morbidity is uh, of concern to us. Uh, can you clarify for me, it seems to me that if the seroprevalence throughout California, and I guess I'd direct this to Dr. Mills, um, is just a little over 12 percent, is the seroprevalence any higher in the islands than in general, I mean significantly higher? Would you consider it significantly higher than other counties, the average throughout California? Oh, well, I, I think the question is throughout California, and uh, Dr. Kramer would be better to answer that. But if you'll allow me to make one statement in relation to that, 70% uh, prevalence in deer mouse populations is unusual. Nevertheless, that is within the variation of uh, temporary prevalences that we've seen from time to time, from year to year, from place to place in, er in other areas of the United States. These, these prevalences are unusual, but we have also seen similar prevalences greater than 60 percent, say, uh, in other areas of the United States. Um, would you like me to also respond sure, to that question? In general, those seroprevalence rates are higher than what we typically find on the mainland, although we do have some foci uh, where we have seen similar, similar rates, usually in a very confined area and often in conjunction with a human case when we do follow-up surveillance. Uh, but as has been mentioned, those, those numbers do fluctuate over time. Uh, but when we first got those results back, that did send up a, a red flag, and that it, it was at that time that we went back and did some further sampling. Okay. Um, in the CDC's um, 
booklet that's included in our packet on emerging infectious diseases. Um, <clears throat> as we're concerned about the emergence of new and um, diseases, especially ones with high morbidity and mortality. There's a statement in here that says we are barely one step ahead of the microbes and under, this underscores our need for a strong and vigilant public health system. Are, are you, anyone can answer or all of you can answer, are you um, pretty co comfortable that a vigilant and strong public health system is in place with regard to this virus? In, in comparison to to other diseases, which uh, may even uh, have many more case, a higher incidence, the the vigilance for hantavirus pulmonary syndrome, I think, is is very high, uh, and it's been developed only within the last six years, and it can certainly be improved. But I think. Uh, our system there in this, as concerns hantavirus pulmonary, pulmonary syndrome is good and getting better. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have no other questions. Thank you. Gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Sherwood, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Mills, I remember reading five or six years ago about the outbreak in the Four Corners area and there was some unusual, and I don't remember what it was, but there was an unusual climactic reason or something for the increase in the population at that time. And I'm absolutely fascinated by your map and the distribution of the cases. And my question to you is, what can we learn from that map and the distribution? For instance, you know, it's very heavy in the Four Corners region and other regions in the West. And then we have three in eastern Pennsylvania, none in Ohio, none in New England. Very interesting. I assume that it might be originally that people, when they went to their hunting camps and cabins that were closed part of the year, came in contact. But, you know, New York State, New England, uh, a very high prevalence of those, and I see no cases. How? How do you explain the distribution? What, and what can we learn from it? Okay. Um, the, sh the short, simple answer about how do we explain the distribution is that we, is that we don't know. Uh, nevertheless, we know that there are local environmental conditions uh, that from time to time lead to high density of rodent populations and consequently high prevalence of infection in those rodent populations. Uh, Human behavior also, uh, like in the Appalachian areas of the United States, cases are frequently associated with entering uh, closed hunting cabins, cleaning out these cabins, or existing in those spaces with populations of infected rodents. Uh, studies that, were, that are ongoing right now, longitudinal long-term studies of rodent ecology in several areas in the southwestern United States are designed specifically to identify uh, those local environmental conditions that are associated and perhaps causative for in local increases in rodent density and increases in prevalence in those populations and in turn increases to, of risk of hantavirus infection for humans. And uh, those studies are starting to yield some results and we're beginning to understand some things but we have a long ways to go. Thank you. I, I think, you know, we can beat each other up about who did what about this, but if we could learn, if we could learn where they're, where they're liable to be and what we do about it, I think, I think there might be a lot to be learned from your distribution chart. And, yes, sir. And if you, if you have any follow-up on that, would you send a copy to my office? <laughs> Certainly will. Thank you. We hope to very soon. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Kildee, did you have uh, any questions? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, to Dr. Mills, uh, do you anticipate that uh, a better funded uh, research would improve uh, your ability to uh, help prevent or find treatment or cure of, of hantavirus and have your request for funding found uh, themselves into the budget? Um, 
Again, I'm, I have to speak from the scientific perspective, and I'm not uh, associated with the uh, funding and policy making. Uh, the, the money that we have received for, for Hantavirus studies in the past, I think, has been put to very good use. Uh, we have learned a tremendous amount in a very short time, just in the last six years. The, and the stage that we are currently at, if you will, uh, in, involves now shifting from our short-term cross-sectional studies to long-term studies that will follow rodent populations through time. Uh, these sorts of studies frequently don't yield very quick results, but they're extremely important. And uh, I would like to emphasize that uh, continuation of funding for these studies is, is important, although funding agencies don't like to frequently fund things that they're not going to see immediate results for. Um, the, the more, and as you well understand, the, the more resources that are available for these sorts of things, the quicker we're going to get results. And while you aren't uh, directly involved in the fiscal aspects of the CDC, uh, it seemed to me that they would be looking down to people like yourself for suggestions uh, as they prepare their budget. Uh, would you feel that uh, a more adequate appropriations might accelerate uh, uh, a find uh, for prevention or treatment or cure of hantavirus? Uh, Again, and I'm going to speak, I'm involved with rodent reservoir studies, which I think are important because uh, understanding the epidemiology of, disease, of a disease such as Hantavirus pulmonary syndrome is based upon a thorough understanding of the ecology of the host species, the deer mouse. Uh, and those, uh, continuation of those is, is, it will be improved by increased funding. Uh, I can't speak to the development of vaccines, uh, development of cures for Hantavirus pulmonary syndrome because I'm not a physician and not involved specifically with that research. All right, I think, I think uh, you've answered my question. Uh, I think that very often we keep funding old programs and something like this comes along and we don't re-examine our priorities and I think this should be a, a high priority. And let me ask you one further question, Mr. Chairman. Uh, do you have any suggestions, uh, either you or the Park Service, for improved cooperation between the Park Service and the CDC, or do you feel that's on an adequate level now? I'll go to you first, Dr. Mills, and then... Uh... The, actually, our collaboration with the National Park Service goes back, uh, goes back a long time, and I think we're off to a very good start. And I can only see... Uh, I would encourage our continued collaboration in the future uh, as, again, as funding for both agencies allowed, allows. There are a lot of things that still need to be pursued, and I am very much looking forward to continued and increased collaboration with the NPS. Mr. Hanley. Thank you. Our relationship with, uh, between the CDC and the uh, National Park Service goes back to 1922, actually Public Health Service and uh, Park Service, uh, with informal agreements between the two parties. Uh, in 1955, there's an MOU between CDC and the Park Service to actually provide technical uh, consultation to the Park Service. So the relationship goes back formally to 1955. and. Uh, and we've been working with them ever since. In fact, the public health program for the um, National Park Service is, is uh, conducted by uh, the CDC. I thank both of you, and uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You'll be back to my time. Thank the gentleman from Michigan. The gentleman from Nevada, uh, Mr. Gibbons. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I think I heard uh, someone say that this disease has been around for at least a couple of decades. I'm curious as to whether or not uh, the number of uh, or the rise in HPS or hantavirus cases is either due to our ability to recognize the disease today uh, or is it uh, due to a spreading of the disease? In other words, is, are we seeing a, a larger number of people being infected versus is this just simply a relationship to our ability to recognize the disease? Does anyone here want to address that question? Since the microphone's right here, I'll give it a stab. Um, 
the answer is yes to both parts of your question. We believe that the increase in number of reported cases, specifically in 99, is due to a greater awareness, but also we believe this year that the rodent populations are greater than average because of the El Nino effect from last year. So the increase in rodent population is probably causing that upswing that we're experiencing in 1999. Dr. Chomel, uh I know you're on the other side of the camera there. I want to uh, thank you for your presence and being able to testify as well. I want to ask you a question, if I may. What are the chances of being uh, either exposed to or becoming infected by indirect contact? In other words, through pets, uh, that our pets in our homes might come in contact with some of these rodents, or alternatively, uh, insects, uh, ticks, flies, mosquitoes, uh, parasites uh, from these rodents, do they carry uh, the disease and can we as humans be indirectly uh, in contact with that to expose uh, us to the disease? Uh, thank you very much for your question. Now, I don't think we have any risk of transmission through uh, vectors like insect or through our pets. Uh, there's been some uh, studies that suggested that uh, eventually a uh, cat could be involved, and that was mainly done in China, and we don't have any uh, uh, support for that in the United States with the hunter virus. We have some studies that have been done indicating possibility of some seroconversion, particularly in coyotes, but uh, we know that the main reservoir is rodent, and you have to have exposure to rodent excreta to be infected. And in fact, the likelihood of getting infected is higher if you are in an enclosed area. Usually in the full outdoor, uh, the risk of contamination is much lower. It does, you know, there is no, no zero risk, but the risk is much lower if you are in an outdoor situation than you are in an indoor situation. Is the university uh, veterinary school there at Davis undertaking a study to see the effect on animals, small animals, domestic animals of the hantavirus uh, outside of the rodent population? Uh, it's not been done at uh, UC Davis. Uh, lack, lack of funding has not allowed us to uh, pursue that uh, field. Okay. Dr. Mills, what will it take in your estimation to get on top of this disease, to get control of it, to uh, uh, reverse the spread, if you will, of this disease? I, I think there are two factors uh, that we need to emphasize. Uh, number one is education, and number two is continued research. Uh, and education are those things that we've talked about here today, that the Channel Islands National Park, especially as a result of uh, this hearing and the, and the events associated with it, is going to be on top of uh, public outreach programs. Those public outreach programs, however, need to be extended uh, to other national parks in the western United States and in the eastern United States and to, and to the general public. Uh, hammer home that message, avoid contact with rodents. A second area of research is going to be physician education. Uh, it's very important that these cases be identified as quickly as possible. Uh, those who enter the hospital soonest are more likely to survive the disease. Well, Dr. Mills, let me ask again also, is uh, every health care provider or facility required to report the incidence of this disease? Uh, it seems to me it's a, it's a budding disease that's just growing out there. Uh, do we have a requirement for health care providers to, to report those? Um, my, my understanding of the rules for reportability is that each, each state decides which diseases within that state will be reportable. The CDC has requested that this uh, uh, that Hantavirus pulmonary syndrome be reported by the states, and the states all seem to be in agreement with that, and we're getting reports from, from all the states. Let me go back to Dr. Chumel again. Uh, does the fact that no one has gotten sick at the Channel Islands uh, mean that no one can get sick there? I, I've, I'm very concerned about this sort of uh, low risk, minimum risk uh, explanation that the Park Service is giving us. Is, it will, can someone get sick from hantavirus uh, by exposure at the park? It could be possible, yes. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I see my time has uh, elapsed and appreciate the uh, time. I thank the gentleman from Nevada. You know, 
I'm much more concerned about where we're going to be tomorrow than, than where we have been in the past. But uh, I, I do need to, for the record, clarify just a couple things because there seems to be a little inconsistency. And I see Tim reaching for the microphone. So uh, you mentioned just a, a couple minutes ago when we were going through uh, uh, your testimony or you in response to a question I had, you said that the Park Service has not toned down their message to the, uh, the, the visitors. Is that correct? Uh, yes, sir. That's correct. Uh, Tim, in a letter that you sent to me dated February 23rd of this year about this issue, you said specifically that the posters about hantavirus in the visitor center have been taken down. Do you remember sending me that letter and telling me that? I do indeed, yes, sir. Okay. Also, uh, on February the 14th of this year, there was a story in the Los Angeles Times where you were quoted. Now, keep in mind, uh, quotes are not always uh, uh, exactly accurate. So for the record, I'd like for you to, to clarify whether your quote was accurate or whether you were misquoted in the Times. In the Los Angeles Times article dated February the 14th, uh, you were quoted as saying, we toned down warnings. Clearly no notice is necessary for a risk that is minimal or non-existent. There's no reason uh, for change. Uh, could you explain, is that quote correct or is it incorrect? The quote is incorrect, sir. The quote is incorrect. So uh, in other words, the, the, the Los Angeles Times was clearly in error. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, Dr. Kramer, uh, would, would you concur that, uh, uh, as, that we are moving in a more positive direction as it relates to notification uh, of this, of this uh, uh, potentially life-threatening uh, virus as it relates to the Channel Islands? Yes. Okay. Uh, what else needs to be done? Uh, keep in mind, you, you, you mentioned earlier that you said that there has been no response from the Park Service as it relates to the concerns of, of Dr. Stratton. It's my understanding that we did not receive a formal response to the letter we sent in March. Uh, what, if any, additional uh, uh, notification or uh, acts on the part of the National Park Service needs to be done according to the, uh, the state health services. What, what can be done more effectively than is currently being done? Well, I think all the steps they've taken recently are, are very positive ones, and the only two additional items that we came up with as a group during our teleconference last month were uh, notification of those visitors who come to the parks in their private boats and then we felt also just press releases to the general public would be effective in helping people understand a little bit more about this disease and what preventive measures they could take. Uh, are you aware that last week, I believe, uh, and maybe Tim can correct me or Ms. Finnerty, uh, on the 23rd that there was a briefing of the Rangers as to how they can better prepare visitors for the potential risk? Yes, a member of my staff gave a formal presentation to the Park Service on June 23rd, during which he discussed uh, safety precautions that they could take, um, reviewed a little bit of the ecology and epidemiology of the disease, and also offered to come back in about a week or two to help them uh, fit the respirators in an appropriate way so that when heavy duty cleanups are required, they will be protected from the disease. Uh, Tim, is this going to be an ongoing program of, uh, uh, of uh, keeping your, your rangers briefed and is this going to be a program where they are going to continue? I, I don't think that it's a matter that we should be out screaming henny penny, the sky is falling, yet at the same time there's some basic and fundamental uh, measures that can be taken to mitigate the risk. Uh, and, and short of that, uh, there, there may be some that are going to hear that henny penny, the sky is falling if we don't take these precautionary uh, uh, measures. Is this an ongoing thing, and is it correct that you did have this meeting last uh, Wednesday or Thursday, the 23rd? Uh, yes, sir. It, it has been ongoing, and we did, in fact, as part of a 
biannual all-employee meeting have an hour session with uh, Dick Davis from uh, okay. the state. Just, just one, one, one uh, final question, uh, and, and I don't want to belabor this because the statement that was made with quotes around uh, uh, the, that you had full attribution for uh, and that you say you were misquoted, did you make any attempt to contact the Times in the form of a letter to the editor or a subsequent conversation with the press to say, hey, you know, I was misquoted. Uh, I didn't say that there is no risk, and I didn't say that we've toned down the, uh, the, the uh, notification. Was there any attempt to clarify your position? Yes, yeah, sometimes after, after, and I'm going to say within the last 30 days, which is not very timely in relation to this. So February, it would have been about four months after the original. I had occasion to talk to uh, one of the staff uh, of the Los Angeles Times and explain to them our concerns about um, the way the story was shaped because it, we felt it was doing a disservice to the rest of the country who thought perhaps if you don't come to Channel Islands National Park, you'll avoid this disease, which clearly is not the case. This is a disease that none of us want to see anyone get. Well, I'm glad you had a chance to do that. The concern is that for four or five months or three or four months, whatever the case might be, is the, the public, the reading public, it was under the uh, assumption based on the quote that uh, was attributed to you that you had toned down the concern that there was no risk or if the risk was minimal or non-existent. The public, based on that quote that was attributed to you, went on believing that that was your position, and uh, uh, that's unfortunate. Uh, Mr. Kelly, did you have anything else? No, I have no further questions, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Gibbons? No, Mr. thank Chairman? you. Well, I, I hope that this is has been helpful uh, this morning. I appreciate the chairman calling this hearing. I know it was inconvenient for you t to fly out here. I'm, uh, I would hope that uh, uh, we will continue to keep a, uh, an open dialogue on this issue. I hope that with the CDC, Dr. Mills, thank you for being here. Dr. Kramer, thank you for being here. Uh, it's going to be very important to us to continue to monitor uh, this issue as it relates to uh, uh, the job that's being done out there. And if there is, in your opinion, you're the professionals, you're the, you're the folks that have dedicated your life to public health. It is uh, you that we look to to see whether the public health is, is protected or not. And it was you that brought this originally to our attention. So we are going to continue to look to you to see whether the Park Service is, is continuing to, to uh, uh, as I'm sure they're fully capable of doing, protect the interests of, of the public health. And if you see other things that n need to be uh, uh, taken care of as we go through uh, changes in, in the weather and changes in, in uh, 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 any number of things, I think that that would be uh, 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 very helpful to us. Uh, Mrs. Finnerty, will you assure the subcommittee that the Park Service uh, will uh, uh, ensure that the Channel Islands is doing everything possible to inform the visitors <laughs> and the employees about the risk of exposure to antivirus in the future? Uh, yes, Congressman, you have our assurance. Will you provide the subcommittee uh, uh, in a month or so a detailed report explaining what specific measures have, have taken place uh, subsequent to, to this hearing? Uh, and uh, uh, I would just like to close, and I hope we can close on a positive note. Mr. Uh, Chairman? Mr. Yes, Chairman, will uh, you Mr. yield for a moment? I would just like to, uh, for the record, ask that perhaps there be an opportunity for us to include some of the research that perhaps the, the medical community, the, the doctors are doing <coughs> to find a cure or a vaccination for this disease as maybe being part of this important record that we're, we've started today. Because I think overall, uh, the people we represent not only want to learn and be educated about the exposure and the chance of, of occurrence of this disease in their area, but they also want to be assured that there's, there's ongoing research, ongoing uh, direct uh, attention to finding a cure and perhaps a vaccination to this very important disease. So if there's any information that either this group through the CDC or uh, through any research and development 
the uh, staff could uh, put into the record and make available for us, I would uh, greatly appreciate that. Uh, With, without objection, uh, we'll ask that that be made a part of the record and uh, uh, that knowledge is uh, is uh, the bottom line to what we're trying to uh, uh, accomplish here this morning. And I do want to close on a positive note. Uh, Tim, I think you have one of the most envious jobs in the country. That is uh, an absolutely spectacular uh, national park. As, as you know, the role that I played some years ago in getting the visitor station uh, named after my dear friend and mentor, Bob Lager Marcino, and the role that he played to bring all this to fruition. And I hope and I trust that you will accept my involvement in this uh, as not anything that would compromise the future of that park, but only protect and preserve and make it uh, uh, a better place for the visitors in my district and surrounding districts. And I would hope from people all across the country to avail themselves of this special park. And uh, I, I hope that you will accept that in the spirit that it was presented and that we'll continue to work together in a positive way. I just appeal to you that, that I consider this as a result of the, the uh, initial uh, communications from state health as something very serious. And it's something that none of us can take lightly because this is not a common cold. As rare as it might be, uh, one visitor to that park that uh, would be, it could contract this disease is one too many. And I just hope we'll continue to work together uh, as I know we have in the past and that we're fully capable of doing in the future. Thank you all for being here this morning. And with that, uh, the uh, committee stands adjourned. U.S. House meets in a little over an hour at 12.30 Eastern for morning hour speeches, then at 2 for legislative business. Today they'll take up a series of bills on veterans' benefits, also a resolution condemning last month's synagogue burnings in California, and a bill calling for a national...